Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch Program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we are streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. And if you have not already done so, please silence your cell phones. So this series has been a good fit for all sorts of Mississippi history topics, but because of the way we do things, sometimes it has not been so great. We try to keep every program to an hour, and a lot of times, especially if folks have um, produced a film, there's just no way for them to show it in this allotted length of time. So we have begun um, a new series this year where on usually the second Sunday, of each month at two o'clock here in this space, we'll show a different film that uh, will run in its entirety. Uh, we won't be live streaming those programs, so you'll have to come to, to be a part of it. And then we'll also try to have a second component to it, whether that's a conversation with the filmmaker or some of the folks who were in the film. Uh, so this month on Sunday, February 12th, and again at 2 p.m. here in the auditorium, we'll screen The Fearless Eleven which is Jackson native Ashley Gibson's documentary about the integration of Provine High School. And we'll be joined by three members of that class for a discussion following that hour-long film. So I hope that y'all will put that on your calendars and come back for that. Uh, remember that on March 2nd and 3rd, the Mississippi Historical Society will hold its annual meeting here in these museums. The session titles are Jackson State University and the HBCU History and Culture, Women in Mississippi History, Environmental History in Mississippi, and 20th Century Mississippi History. You can find details on that online. And then over um, by the coffee and snacks, you'll find some little reminders about a program that our friends at Mississippi College are having for Black History Month, where Dr. Kelly Carter Jackson will be down on February 9th, that's next week at 7 p.m. Uh, and it, it, she has written some fantastic books, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that, so hope that you'll be able to make it to that as well. Finally, I hope that you'll come back next Wednesday for History is Lunch when Calvin Hawkins and Dottie Reed will present Preserving Local History. Today, we are delighted to welcome author Ann Martin to talk about Delta Hot Tamales, History, and Stories. I told Malcolm White that I would normally have made a joke about the specials that he was offering at Hall and Mal's restaurant if he hadn't just sold the thing on hot tamales, and we agreed that the special probably would be he would double the price. Ann Martin grew up eating hot tamales in her hometown of Greenville and has long been curious about the origins of the food. A former television news anchor and reporter, she currently writes for such magazines as Delta and Life in the Delta. You don't, you don't want to get those mixed up. And has published in Eat, Drink, Mississippi and The Sip, she is a co-founder of the Hot Tamale Festival in Greenville and the author of Delta Hot Tamales, History, Stories, and Recipes. She is at work on a book about the 1927 Mississippi River flood. Help me welcome Ann Martin. Good afternoon. First of all, I have got to tell you what a thrill it is for me to be in this building. I love history, especially Mississippi history, and this building gets talked about a lot with a particular circle of friends that I have, and we think, oh, it's down at archives. We could go to archives. We could go down there. So to be in this building really means a lot to me. I have a question to ask you, a little audience participation. Answer this question. If you have a food allergy and it doesn't count, who in here has never had a hot tamale? Okay, when this is over, go on over to Howlin' Mouse and get some of Tony's tamales, okay? All right. Everybody else in here seriously has had tamales? I love that. Of course, we are in Mississippi, but you'd be surprised at how many don't eat them or how many haven't tried them. Hot tamales are something that I grew up eating. From the time I was three or four years old, they were always something that was in the house. We always heard about people eating tamales. And 
we, there was a little bit of discussion about having tamales today, and I'm really sorry we didn't bring any. Uh, but I encourage you all to go get some later. And I know that Jeff Wong, where are you, brought his own. So thank you, Jeff, for doing that. Um, tamales are, are a very regional food to the state of Mississippi. And when I was a kid, there were only two or three places that I knew you could get them, mainly out of the trunk of somebody's car or off of a push cart. But they were always good, and it never occurred to me that there might have been health regulations because we just ate them. This was long before the health department got truly involved in saying, you know, you probably really shouldn't eat those or you've got to have this certificate or that certificate. But, you know, I would, you just never saw them. You never went to anybody's home and saw hot tamales. You never went in a restaurant and saw hot tamales. You had to get them either out of the trunk of somebody's car or the push cart. So, even as a kid, it's like, where do these things come from that are so very good and very messy in some instances? There are two or three trains of thought. We don't know 100% for sure, but it is believed that hot tamales came in to this country two ways. From the Mexican-American War, when the soldiers came back, they had these recipes for these tamales. And they took these recipes, sometimes not even a full recipe, it was a partial recipe. And, and the women would try to recreate it. The other train of thought, which is widely believed, is that when the migrant Mexican workers came in to help farm the cotton, they brought the recipes with them. I mean, it stands to reason. When, when these men came into this country to work, they brought some of their native food with them. Well, lo and behold, it was the African-American females, the cooks, that took those recipes and tried to turn them into what we have today. The Mexican recipes were, they, they were steamed. And our hot tamales, the Delta hot tamales, are simmered. And when the hot tamale festival first started, there had to be that distinction. They kind of relaxed that because people do cook them different ways. But when these recipes would get into the hands of the American cooks and they didn't have all the ingredients or the ingredients were different, they were like, okay, how are we going to do this? So the African-American female cook took what she had on hand. She had cornmeal. The Mexicans used masa, although you do have a lot of American tamale makers now who do use masa, but they had the cornmeal and they would use pork and whatever seasonings they had. And, of course, the corn shucks were ready av available off the farms. The Mexican tamales were a lot blander tasting than what we had. And don't let the word hot fool you. I know some of you probably have had hot tamales that were very spicy and others that were more mild. It's strictly a personal taste, but I bet you've never had two hot tamales that tasted exactly the same. <laughs> have you? They're all different, even though when you get down to the recipes, they're very similar. I've even had one hot tamale maker tell me that, point blank, when I've asked her, what's the secret? She said, we all use the same dadgum ingredients. It's just how much we put in there. And I got to looking, and she's basically right, unless somebody's thrown in something a little strange and different that they want to pop in there. But there's nothing better than tamales straight out of the pot that have been simmering in that luscious juice soaking up all that flavor. And when I started doing research for this book several years ago, and I would be eating the hot tamales, and you look at that and think, wow, this came from something from a total other country, and somebody here thought it would be a good idea to copy it and make it their own. And I am so glad they did. I love hot tamales. I can't eat them like I used to. Uh, there was a point in time when, I, when researching the book, even though I don't rank or rate how good the hot tamales are or are not, I do have my favorites, I felt like I owed it to everyone I interviewed that I had to try the hot tamales, you know? So there were a couple of days there where I would bring tamales home and subjected my husband to tamales for supper, tamales for breakfast, tamales for lunch, tamales for supper, and it was like, okay, we gotta stop, you know? But everybody that makes tamales now they all have their own little twist on the recipe. They all have their own little twist on how they make them. And their stories are absolutely 
amazing because they all have a story to tell. And I'm going to share some of those stories with you. And you'll notice that the bulk of the people that are in the book and that I talk about are African American. It is still a dish that is primarily found in the African American kitchen. Even some of the African American hot tamale cooks still aren't exactly sure why that is, except they're it's just been part of the, of the African-American culture for so long to make hot tamales. They're the ones that do it. And they have the patience. Because making hot tamales, anybody in here ever made hot tamales? How long did it take you to do it? How many days? Did it take you two days to do it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it is not, oh, we want tamales for supper. Let's go in here and whip some up and an hour later, there you go. Mm -mm. If that's what you call a hot tamale, it's a bit of a cheat. Hot tamales take two days, no matter how you cut it. You have to cook that meat, season that meat. A lot of people now will use brisket. Uh, they use beef and pork. Some people do turkey. Some people do chicken. It's really personal preference on what you use. We have a friend back home that has been making them with venison lately. I haven't tried them yet, but I've heard they're really good. I've had uh, other friends who've said, oh, I want some duck tamales. Just haven't found anybody to do that yet. But you have to get that meat ready, and then you shred the meat, or ever, whether it's ground or shredded, ever how that particular tamale maker wants their, their meat. And then you have to get it cold so you can handle it. And then sometimes they will go ahead and flavor the masa or the cornmeal and put the flavor in both so you get double flavor. Well, then all of that has to get cold so you can handle it. Then the next day, you actually put the tamales together, whether you're using a machine or by hand. And I'm going to tell you more about that in a little bit. But tamales today, while we can go to Hallamal's, you can go to Tony's, you can go to roadside stands, uh, you can go into nice restaurants and find tamales where you used to couldn't. It used to be the only way you could get a tamale was off a cart. The Jefferson family, three brothers, began making tamales back in the 50s, and they were about to quit making tamales. They decided they'd had enough when the Hot Tamale Festival came along, and they won the first year. And they said, well, maybe we need to keep, keep making them. And their tamales were absolutely wonderful. But the Jeffersons... Uh, the three uh, brothers, Gerald, William, and George, and this is William. Yes, one of the brothers was George Jefferson, and he got the moving on up jokes all the time and didn't mind at all. They had two carts that they would run around Greenville in, uh, and this one is was in downtown Greenville near the old Stein Mart, the original Stein Mart, for those of you that know where that is. And the Jeffersons got this recipe, and they're their father kind of tweaked it a little bit and they worked with it. They finally got it the, the, the exact way that they liked it. So I remember asking George, you know, what's the secret? What's the secret to your tamales? Why are they so good and why should people eat? He said, it's the garlic. Everybody uses garlic in their hot tamales. But he said it was the amount of garlic that he had put in there, and they worked on that recipe till they got it down exactly pat to what they wanted. But the Jeffersons were all over Greenville, and I remember buying hot tamales as a kid from the Jeffersons downtown when my mom and I would, and my sister would go into downtown Greenville on Saturday afternoon to do the errands, and I remember distinctly they would also sell them out of the trunk of the car. And, you know, we didn't think it was anything to buy food out of the trunk of somebody's car. And we'd go home and eat hot tamales. Um, so the Jeffersons are still making them, but they make them at home now. They no longer have the cart. And I wish they did. But there's one man that I consider as the godfather of the Delta hot tamale, and that is Joe Pope. There is a small building in downtown Rosedale that, to me, sells some of the best hot tamales in the state of Mississippi. Joe started making hot tamales in about the 19, late 1960s, early 70s. He got arrested. He had, this little building he had was a little juke joint, and it was a hangout spot. And then later he added the tamales. But there was a gentleman in town named John Hooks 
who was making tamales back in the 1930s. And when Mr. Hooks decided that he was going to go out of business, Joe Pope decided, hey, let me try that. It's a great way to make a little bit of money. Everybody likes them. It's a cheap, easy recipe to make. It's just time consuming. So Joe Pope worked on his recipe till he got it exactly the way he wanted it. And people would drive for miles around to get his hot tamales. There are still people to this day that claim they are using Joe Pope's recipe. According to his sister, that is not true. Barbara Pope took over the business from Joe, uh, and this is the way the building looked when, when Joe had it. And this is a wonderful photograph that um, the, the, ca the cafe no longer looks like this, but the building is still there, and we're so glad it is. This is Joe's sister, Barbara. Barbara began making the hot tamales in 2006. She had come home to help care, take care of her ailing mother. Joe was several years older. Well, while she was there, Joe decided he was going to get sick and ended up in the hospital. While Joe was in the hospital, I'm sorry, it was 2004. While Joe was in the hospital, on his deathbed, Barbara and one of her sisters were sitting there, and Joe said, do you know how to make the hot tamales? Do you know the recipe? Barbara said, no. I don't want to make hot tamales. Barbara was living in Chicago working. She would just come home to take care of mom. And Joe said, well, let me tell you the recipe. On his deathbed, he gave her the recipe. And Joe died. So several days later, she asked the sister, said, did you pay attention to the recipe? Because I didn't. Well, between the two of them, they got it down. Barbara tweaked it just a little bit to put her own spin on it, and those are some mighty fine tamales, and she is still carrying on Joe's legacy. Barbara has no idea what's going to happen to her when she decides to retire or depart this earth. Barbara's been ready to retire, but she can't find anybody to buy the business. None of those kids, you know, the kids don't want to come back home, especially not to little old bitty Rosedale. They're in other states. And this is what happens to a lot of your hot tamale vendors. Uh, they've got these great recipes, and they guard them. It's not like, oh, can I have your mama's pound cake recipe? And you gladly give it to me. People do not share their hot tamale recipes. And I have at, I just saw Clint's face like, no, they don't. And they don't. People will go to the grave with the hot tamale recipe with them up here. Uh, there are folks that I've talked to that said, oh, yeah, I've got the recipe. It's up here. And I said, why don't you have it written down? I don't want anybody to get it. Well, what are you going to do when you die? Well, unless somebody, the family or somebody doesn't buy the business and I can give them the recipe, it's going with me. And that is what is happening all across Mississippi with hot tamale makers. The recipes are going to the grave. And I've asked a couple of, of the cooks, why is this happening? Why don't they want to share it or at least write it down and go put it in the lockbox for somebody to find later? They said because they've worked on it so hard because everybody has taken that recipe and worked on it so extremely hard they don't want to share it. Barbara says that there's a nephew that has it and knows how to make them, but she kind of doubts he's going to come back to Rosedale and do it. So in the meantime, we just tell Miss Barbara she's got to take good care of herself. Now, one of the things I love about Joe Pope's hot tamales, Miss Barber's hot tamales, they're entirely made by hand. It does take two days to make them, and when you do it all by hand, it's very time-consuming. Hot tamales can be made two different ways. There's a machine called an extruder where you can take your meat and put it in one cylinder, put your masa or cornmeal mixture in another one, and hit a button, hit a lever. There, there are different ways, and out comes a little tube of meat. And then you have to wrap it in the shuck. So no matter how you make it, hands have to touch hot tamales. Every hot tamale you've ever eaten has been touched by hands. There's no way around it. They have not invented a tamale rolling machine. This is Susie Irwin. Susie's been working for Barbara for years, and she helps Barbara make the tamales. Barbara will do all the cooking, and then Susie will come in on Tuesday mornings. Front door will be open. The storm door will be locked. 
The clothes signed is out, but Susie's inside rolling tamales. She will have a bowl of water, which you see right there, the blue bowl, and the corn shucks go in the water just to get them a little pliable. And this is the masa mixture. No, this is the meat mix. That's the masa. Yeah. She, by feel, can knows how much to pick up, puts it on top of that corn shuck, and then will get a handful of meat and put it on top of there. And as she rolls it, it rolls out into the tube that we know is the hot tamale. So Susie's rolled thousands and thousands and thousands of hot tamales, and she sits there and ties them in bundles of three. During the winter, they make a couple thousand hot tamales. When it's really cold, like now, people want something warm to eat, slacks off a lot during the summer, where she may only make a couple hundred dozen during the week. People will come to the white front with their coolers, drive from Memphis, come up from Jackson, all over the Delta, and load up on tamales and put them in the freezer. And Barbara's always got a pot on the stove, simmering with the tamales. And Barbara never intended to do this, but she knew it was important to keep this business going. It was her brother's legacy. She knew what he had put into it. She knew what it meant to the community, and she knew that it was a part of Delta history that this particular business stay up with, that these hot tamales continue. It is also the only place in Mississippi, and Malcolm or somebody correct me if this has happened since then, this is the only place in Mississippi that a, a restaurant is both on the Blues Trail and the Mississippi Hot Tamale Trail because there are songs that have been written about hot tamales and so many famous artists have also come by here. You walk in and it's just a history on her walls and it's a tiny little place. But people will come from all over the world, seriously. When it's blues festival season and they're traveling up and down 61, they hop over on Highway 1 and come see her because of her connection to the blues and not just the tamales. And, you know, it's a landmark for us, but the tamales are so frigging good. They really are probably one of our favorites. I have about five, but Barbara's such a, a treasure to our community and to keep that recipe and keep it going, we all just hope that one day there will be someone else that will, will take that recipe and carry it on because you don't want those recipes to go away. Well, just about the same time that, that um, Joe Pope was getting started and thinking about doing tamales, there was a family in Medcalf, Mississippi, the Scott family, and the mom and dad, Aaron and Elizabeth Scott, were out in San Antonio. Mr. Scott was in the military. He was stationed out there. And Elizabeth became pregnant with their first child. Now, any woman in here who's ever had a baby, we've all had cravings. Hot tamales was never one of mine. Elizabeth wanted hot tamales. And her husband, being the good husband that he was, always went and found the hot tamales for his pregnant wife. He got tired of going out and finding hot tamales. San Antonio, there were probably tamales. The family's not sure about that point. But he got tired of going out and finding them, so he decided, I'm going to learn how to make them myself. He found a recipe and had to pay for it, and it was not complete. His daughters have since told me that they don't have any idea how much their father paid for it, but he got that recipe, brought it home, he and Elizabeth worked on it, and they added one thing or another and took away until they got the recipe they wanted, and it tasted like they wanted it to. And as life went on, and they found their way back to the Delta, they were from the area, he thought, hmm, you know, hot tamales might be a good little way to, to make some extra money. So the Scots started making hot tamales in 1941. They, too, had a cart that they would roll through parts of downtown Greenville, through certain neighborhoods, and Aaron would go through the streets yelling, Molly Man, get your red hots. And they knew the hot tamale man was in the neighborhood. They did that for a long while. Well, people kept buying the hot tamales and kept buying the hot tamales, and the family kept growing till eventually, as the kids got older, they taught all of their children how to make hot tamales. 
And in the summer, or during the school season especially, the kids would get home from school. The, oh, they also had a big garden out back. The kids would get home from school and they had a choice. They either had to go work the garden or they could come inside and make hot tamales. Well, guess which one they picked? They all said, we wanted to go inside under the air conditioning. Every one of those kids who were all now grandparents and great-grandparents, they all know how to make hot tamales. And every Tuesday and Wednesday, they still gather at their parents' home. Dad eventually built uh, an addition to the house. There's a kitchen and workspace just for hot tamales. Everybody, they all have on their Scott's Hot Tamale t-shirts. They gather together and, and do everything that needs to be done. And everybody that works is a member of that family. No one that isn't a member is allowed to work on the hot tamales. Can't tell you how many times I've escorted other reporters and journalists in there, and we're all crammed in this little room. But the camaraderie of this family and how much fun they have is just absolutely amazing. And they, uh, and their hot now their hot tamales are a little shorter, but they're delicious. They sell them. You can buy them from them. They also ship them across the country. They have a little hot tamale stand that's barely as wide as one panel of the stage. And they make them at the house, bring them to the little stand, and they sell out all the time. But they are committed to keeping that recipe and their father and mother's legacy is alive. As a matter of fact, when the Delta Hot Tamale Festival started, there was a component of that festival we thought just to have something fun to do, we would have royalty, hot tamale king and queen. And the very first person that was asked to be the hot tamale queen was Elizabeth Scott. And Miss Scott just said, uh-uh, uh that's not me. And, and so we had to go to plan B. You'll hear more about that in a minute. But um, the Scots still are carrying on what their mother and father started. And they... Um, they are really known as the first family of hot tamales in the Delta. They, they all know the recipe. They know what to do. Some of the family members say, I know how to make them. I don't know the recipe and don't need to know the recipe. But they've worked very hard to keep this tradition alive. And they've gotten accolades from all over the country about what, the, what they are doing. And the Scots are going to be around for a very, very long time. So if you're ever in Greenville, look them up as well. Now, many of you, and there, are, this is, make sure I've got the right thing, yeah, um, at Doe's. Recognize that red and white checkered tablecloth. And I've already had somebody say, oh, did you bring Doe's tamales? I said, nope, didn't bring any today. But the Delta, one of the most famous hot tamale makers in the Delta has got to be Doe's Eat Place. And I think it's just because Doe's itself is so famous. Doe's began about the same time as Mr. Scott in the 1940s. 1941 is to be exact. And when Big Doe Signa had a little corner grocery store and he began to sell steaks out of the back door, had his, the African-American clientele came in the front and the white clientele came in the back. He'd gotten this recipe and brought it home and, and he and Miss Mamie worked on it tweaked it till they got it exactly how they wanted it and they started selling hot tamales they said well this will be a great little addition and we make some money off of it and it's you know like I said it's a very inexpensive or it was a very inexpensive dish to make it just took a lot of time well Big Doe Signal who's no longer with us guarded his recipe so much he only made them in the middle of the night. He would not make them during the day so anyone could see what he was doing. He did not want that recipe out. He would go get his sons, Little Doe and Charles, who are now Big Charles and Big Doe, they would go to school, go to bed, and then he would go get them up about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning to go with him back to Doe's, the same restaurant that's there now, to make hot tamales. And for years, they didn't know the recipe. They just knew they had to make them with, with dad. He would not make them with absolutely anybody else there. And this went on for years. The other thing, if you look at those hot tamales, they look a little different from earlier pictures. 
Anybody, anybody notice the difference? There's no shucks. These are wrapped in parchment paper, and there's a reason. Back in the late 60s, early 70s, Big Doe was getting his corn shucks from Texas. And shucks would come in, they'd roll them, do their thing. Well, the supplier in Texas petered out, and they ended up getting them from somebody in Mexico. They went on until one day Big Doe got a new supply of corn shucks delivered to Doe's, and he opens up the box, and there are corn shucks, and there's also an extra herb in there that he did not order. So somebody, somebody's load of pot ended up in Greenville, Mississippi by accident. I never have been able to find out what they did with it, but from that day forward, Big Doe said, uh-uh, I can't have that, and he went to the parchment paper. And the, the grandsons now, uh, Charles and Doe, have said they have considered going back to the corn shucks, but this is how everybody identifies the Doe's tamale now is the paper. And some people think that the corn shuck gives it maybe a little extra flavor. It definitely gives it more of an aesthetic look because you get the ridges from the corn shuck once the tamale has been wrapped in there. And they are not as secretive undercover making the tamales anymore. They, uh, both of the, the sons know it, a couple of their family members know it, a couple of the workers there know enough about it. They do make them in broad daylight now. Uh, and I think about four or five family members are fully aware of the recipe. And I don't think we've got any worry at all that this recipe is going to go anywhere anytime soon. It's, it's, it's there to stay. Uh, people here again will drive for miles just to get these hot tamales. And it all started, as we see with so many of these stories, it started because somebody got a recipe or a part of a recipe and wanted to make these tamales. It was a great way to make money, and that's the way uh, what most people did at the time. They were doing it to make money. And, but there are others who are carrying on the tradition. Uh, this is my friend Malcolm Dye from Cleveland. He also plays Santa Claus. That's why the, the white beard. And Malcolm's been making hot tamales for a number of years. Just on the side is something to do. And he sells the heck out of them. He'll put something on Facebook. I've got tamales. Let me know if you want them. He sells out. He travels around selling them now that he's retired. He found, a, here again, found a recipe that he liked and tweaked it until it became his own. Malcolm's the only one with the recipe. And he said, when I'm gone, Nobody in my family will probably make them because none of my kids are interested. You know, nobody wants to put in the time on some things to get to the end result. We're such an instant society. This is not an instant food by any stretch of the imagination. It depends. You've got to cook the meat first. I was just asked, how long do you cook them? You cook that meat ever how long it takes to cook your meat. That's one of the main variables. Once you put them together and get them in the pot, whether it's this ginormous industrial pot or the saucepan on top of your stove with water, usually, what did we do those other day, about a half an hour or so, Bill? Yeah, about a half an hour. A friend of mine gave us some that needed to be cooked, so you simmer them about a half an hour. Some people put additional seasonings in the water. Some people don't. There again, it's chef's choice. But somebody who made a choice many years ago is Shine Thornton. Shine was a character, to say the least. He was, he did a little bit of this, a little bit of that, played in a big band, and played his, his fiddle in the Catholic Church. It was just a sweetheart, never met a stranger. And he decided, Shine um, was always trying to find a way to support his family. He had a real job that, you know, he got up and went to a business and health insurance and all that. But Sean decided, I need to make a little more money for my family. So he tried bootlegging. And um, he finally sold his steel and everything, <laughs> everything he had, and said, I'm going to try something else. Well, then he ran across the hot tamales. And um, he got this recipe. took him years to get it right. He was never happy with it. Tried and tried and tried and tried and tried until he finally got it. His wife's name was Mary, but he took 
the Italian version and named his hot tamales Maria's famous hot tamales. And he finally got it down. And he was selling them out of his house, like a lot of hot tamale people do. And somebody from the health department came to see him one day and said, you can't do this, you've got to have a separate building. So he built a separate little kitchen just off his carport that he did all of his tamale making in. And then he found out later that he didn't really have to do that. But he had the sign hanging up, Maria's Famous Tamales. And he found out that President George W. Bush liked hot tamales. He tried his darndest to get hot tamales delivered to the White House. It never happened. But he never gave up. I can't tell you, I mean, even after that. He, kept, he always talked about trying to, he wanted hot tamales in Washington. And Shine loved cooking the tamales. He took part, there were some other tamale cooking contests that took place in uh, the 80s. Frank Carlton, the former district attorney in, that was based in Greenville, put on a hot tamale contest. Shine won it several years. And instead of giving trophies, they gave these great big belt buckles like the wrestlers get. And Shine got it a couple of times. So when the Hot Tamale Festival came along and Elizabeth Scott graciously declined, the committee said, well, let's ask Shine. And the thought was they wanted somebody who was connected to hot tamales to be the royalty. So Shine was the next obvious choice. And the phone call was made to Shine, we'd love for you to be king. And he said, can I think about it? Because I think I want to enter the cooking contest. And we went, okay. Two or three days went by and he called back. And uh, he said, no, I want to enter the cooking contest, but thank you anyway. So now we're down to the third person to be the royalty for the festival. And we go to Florence Signa. Now, Florence is part of the Cigna family at Doe's. And if you've ever been to Doe's, she was the lady always making the salad. And Florence, God rest her soul, just left us about three weeks ago. Uh, and she was just so much a part of Doe's. And she, I even asked her one time, even though she didn't make the tamales, I said, Florence, why do people like hot tamales so much? What is the attraction? She said, I don't know. But they come in here and eat them up. She said, you know, I can take them and leave them. But people like them. That's all that matters. So we asked Florence, Florence, would you like to be the queen of the Hot Tamale Festival? Immediately, well, I would love to. Thank you so much for asking me. Within an hour, Sean Thornton calls up and says, you know what, I changed my mind. If y'all are going to be so gracious as to ask me to be the king, I really think I need to do that. So that's how there was both a king and a queen for the very first Hot Tamale Festival. And Shine was a great king, as was Florence that first time. And, but Shine, he just embodied hot tamales. He loved them. Even though it took a lot of time, and he did most of the work by himself, nobody was helping him cook. He did, a, uh, he did buy an extruder at some point, and every now and then he'd get somebody to help roll. He did them mainly himself. But hot tamales such a regional food, you know, that you go around the country and there are other foods that are very much a part of that region that you just don't hear about outside that region. And hot tamales have been such a part of the Mississippi Delta for as long as we can remember, it was only fitting that one day there be a festival. And in 2012, myself, Betty Lynn Cameron, and Valerie Rankin decided we need, to, we need to do something to honor the hot tamale. We, had a, uh, we were part of a group uh, uh, that got together and cooked and ate on the weekends. We would pick a theme and we would cook food to go with that theme. You know, what does everybody want this week? Oh, gumbo, or we want this or we want that. And one weekend we said, let's do hot tamales. Let's have vendors representative from across the area and invite a few extra people and judge them. So we had a little mini festival in Valerie's backyard. And we did judge them. And the Jeffersons, the gentleman I showed you at the beginning with the cart, he was voted the best that particular day. When we got through and we were standing in Valerie's kitchen and we all looked around and we said, wow, this was 2011 in October. I think we just had the first unofficial hot tamale festival. Can we do this? Well, at the time, Betty Lynn was the executive director of Main Street Greenville. So we had our 501c3 umbrella to fall under. The following October, we had the very first hot tamale festival. 
Haven't missed a year since, except pandemic, but we still had t-shirts. And there are about 30,000 people that come to that festival now. Hot tamale makers from all over come. We've seen new people who've never made hot tamales before have been inspired to pick up the mantle and make hot tamales, which is wonderful. It's being carried on. We have a friend back home that brought me hot tamales Friday or Saturday and said, I w I've just made these. He called me several months prior and he said, I need a hot tamale recipe. I need to get your book. And the, the recipe that is in the book is the one that came from the Southern Foodways Alliance, from the Delta Hot Tamale Trail that Amy Evans put together several years ago. And I said, this is the recipe. If anybody asks me for one, this is what I'm going to give you because I don't know how to cook them. I don't need to know how to cook them. There's too many good people out there. I can go buy them, and I'd rather go buy them, not mess up my kitchen. I just want to eat them. And Colby made hot tamales and brought them to us, and I was like, Wow. And he's really serious about doing this. So he and another friend have been making them, and they were good. And there are other people that are young people. There's a young gentleman from Atlanta, Georgia, who originally from Greenville, who won the festival probably right before the pandemic. And he still is in Atlanta and bought the food truck, has got it all decked out, tamales are good. And he goes to Memphis, he goes to... I think to Houston, comes to Greenville on a regular basis in addition to selling Delta Hot Tamales in Atlanta. So the recipes are getting out. The other way those recipes are getting out is when someone from the Delta moves to, here and I'll show you the picture of the festival, that's what the streets look like. When people leave the Delta that know how to make tamales, they'll take those recipes with them. And I know there are several hot tamale places in Chicago so if you go to Chicago, you can find Delta Hot Tamales because there are people there with a Mississippi Delta connection. When I was doing research for this book, and, and like I said, I don't make tamales. I like to eat them. But I was trying to think of other ways. What else can you do with a hot tamale besides just unwrap it and put your condiment of choice or nothing naked on it? Do you eat it with a saltine or not? And we were sitting there, this is one of those days when we had been eating hot tamales for every meal, and my husband and I were sitting there, and apparently we had had hot dogs recently, because there were hot dog buns there, and I had a thought, I went, oh, I got a thought, and I jumped up, buttered that bun, warmed up a couple of tamales, slapped them on there, got some chili out, and cheese, and slaw, just happened to have all that, and I thought, look what I made, and it was good, I think you probably needed a bottle of Pepto to go with it. But then I got to looking it up, and somebody in Chicago had already created it. It's called a mother-in-law. Don't know why. But you can use a tamale as an ingredient in other recipes. So the tamale is it's our food. When I think of Mississippi foods, it's one of the things I think of because it's a happy food. You really can't say the word hot tamale without smiling. It's just a feel-good food. But you can't walk in just any restaurant and get it, not like a hamburger. And even people put a little spin on a hamburger. You've got to find and seek out the people that make the hot tamale. And as long as these recipes are passed on and young people are interested in picking up this time-honored tradition, we're going to have hot tamales. So I encourage you to always visit your local hot tamale vendors and the next time you go into Tony's or you go to go to Vicksburg go to Solly's or you're down in the Delta just tell that hot tamale vendor thank you and please pass on this recipe because there's no way we can do without it my first memory of hot tamales is as a kid my mom was cooking supper and our back door neighbors were related to the Cygnus at Doe's and worked up there sometimes there was a knock on the door and opened the door, and our neighbors were, were Tilly and Sav, short for Salvador. And there was the big industrial can, which you can't do it anymore. They, they packed them in, in the cans with the juice, covered it with newspaper and a rubber band. And there they were with the can. And whatever mama was cooking got put on the back of the stove and turned off because we had hot tamales. That happened often. So when you eat hot tamales, you're eating our history and enjoy every single bite. And remember, you can't say hot tamales without smiling. Thank you, and happy hot tamales, everybody. All right. <coughs> Question, let me bring the mic to you, and everybody can hear you.
Are they big down Mexico and Central America and stuff like that? The tamales are. Tamales are. You can still get tamales. And there have been a couple of restaurants we've been to where I've gone, oh, i got to try it. And they're just, there's no comparison because this is what we're, you know, we're, we're used to. Well, let's go back this way. I'll back it up. You know, we're, we're used to, to this and that. And down there, they're just so big. And to me, they're bland. But, you know, everybody doesn't like everything. So. I know this is not traditional, but you didn't mention vegetarian tamales. Oh, I'm, no, no, no. Hang on. Did I have that in here? Uh, it's not traditional, but I have a friend in Greenville who makes vegetarian tamales. And one of the, it's not that one. Is that, that may not, that's not it. There's a lady in Greenville that makes vegetarian tamales, and there was a lady in Rosedale that passed away but several months ago who made them, and they are delicious. For three years running at the festival, a vegetarian tamale was grand champion. She had cheese and tomatoes and spinach. They, and she had somebody in her family was coming to visit and was a vegetarian, and they said, oh, just season up some masa for me that'll, or cornmeal. That'll be fine. She goes, no, 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 no. And if you Google vegetarian tamales, there are a lot of recipes out there. The lady in Rosedale that used to make them, she would say, what vegetables do you want in them? I'm going, I don't know. What do you mean? Whatever vegetables. I'm talking broccoli, Brussels sprouts, you name it. She would grind it up and put it in there. She did a lot of black beans, tomatoes, and corn. But, yeah, they're out there, and they're good. Anybody else? Yes, please. Uh, oh, there we go. I'm sorry. I'm not going to That's okay. You. I'm going to use the mic, though. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's a couple of comments. Number one, those young ladies that were at that festival had on shucks. Their skirts were made out of corn shucks. Yes, they are. I saw them at the festival a couple. I went there two or three times. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Those All skirts are heavy. We've yes. changed your costume. Uh, <laughs> I was quite impressed with those shucks on a, as a skirt. Also, <laughs> but you feel like a bear. <laughs> There's a that hot tamale place. I fell in love with hot tamales as a kid. My dad was a postman here in Jackson, and he would stop on West Street. There was a man who had a hot tamale shop on West Street. The best hot tamales I ever tasted. Maybe that's because I was a kid and try to remember it like that. But. Um, there's a place in Vicksburg called the Tamale Place. Mm -hmm. They make some of the best hot tamales you'll find in Mississippi. Also, there are other places in Jackson. There's the, the restaurants like Shapley's or the Shapley's? Shapley's. Shapley's, see, they make a very good hot tamale. It's a big, round hot tamale. And I, I, for some reason, I just don't want them unless they're in some shucks. <laughs> so you don't like the shucks? No, he you does. do like the shucks. I don't like the, the thing, and I want to, to play off that, you know, you go into restaurants now, and, and it, it's only been in about the past, I'm going to say, Malcolm, when did y'all start serving tamales, or did you always serve them? Okay. Right. But that, that time frame fits in that, like Mexican food, had, a, had to hit the mainstream of, of our culinary habits. Hot tamales had to find their mainstream. So you go into restaurants now from Shapley's to, to very small places and then lots of folks in between who now have tamales on the menu. But you will find a hot tamale on a cracker being passed around at parties on a silver tray in addition to the little red and white checkered places. So they, they have crossed all the barriers and are available anywhere now. Can the tamales be frozen? Yes, tamales can be frozen. Um, I have bought them both uncooked and cooked to be, uh, and, and froze them. Shine Thornton from Maria's Tamales, when I would call him and say, hey, I need tamales, and he would say, do you want them frozen or not? And I would say, yes, I need them frozen. And you would pick them up, and he would give you a little baggie of his secret seasoning with instructions on how to cook them. You know, they were, the, the meat was cooked. But he would put the, you would put them in the pot with those seasonings, let it come to a boil for ever how long. But the ones we got the other day were frozen when we got them. And I just popped them in the, in the pot with some water and let it go. But you can freeze them cooked and uncooked. I was just going to say that the place on West Street that you mentioned was Jack's. And I, yeah, 
I think there was another branch, later there was some, another branch of Jack somewhere else, but yeah, my family had Jack's hot tamales at least once a week in the, in the 40s and 50s. But see, it's one of those foods that just conjures up all these memories. We don't sit around and talk about steak or hamburgers like this, do we? Right. But there's something about a hot tamale that just conjures up all these great memories. Hi, I'm from Mexico, so I grew up <coughs> making tamales with my grandma. So I promise you there are some great <laughs> Mexican recipes. Oh, I'm sure there <laughs> are. But um, my question was, how far do you trace the tamales here? Like, what's the earliest mention? or when they first appeared in Mississippi? From my research, and if anybody knows anything and can add to this, it's, it's early part of the 1900s uh, is what we're guessing because we really don't know definitively when they came in. You know, was it with the migrant workers or the Mexican-American War? But uh, at least the early, early part of the 1900s. And I know there's some good ones down there. I've had some or time or two, but there's just some, something about a Delta hot tamale. <laughs> yes, I have had that one time. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, you've got one online. Got, it, got one from the live stream. Uh, the ask is, what was the name of the place near the Pearl River? My dad would bring hot tamales home from there. That was a branch of Jack's as well. Okay. And then uh, Valerie Franklin, thanks to the man who liked our, uh, oh yeah, shuck skirts. <laughs> Labor of love. Oh, let me tell you, there have been more burned fingertips and um, wardrobe malfunctions with those shuck skirts. Right. But, uh, it, you know, here again, when we decided to do this, it was truly because the three of us to this day, even though we're not in the forefront, but we're, we're just the goodwill ambassadors for hot tamales in the festival. We wanted to honor the hot tamales. So what better way to do that than wear the shock, you know? And we still do, just not as much of it. I guess it was just a few years ago that was it the couple who had the suck the shucks uh, tamale shop in Clinton won some sort of contest and they got several tens of thousands of dollars to maybe go to Meridian and open it. Might anybody else remember this? There was, we lost a great place in Clinton yeah. to go. <laughs> there was another stream of hot tamale contests for a short period of time. I'd forgotten about that. Um, but the thing about this that I just, I just want people to keep making them. I want restaurants to keep selling them. So that means we have to keep eating them no matter what it does to us. <laughs> you know, um, it's like, oh, shucks, let me have one more. It's like, like the oysters we had last night, I'm not leaving that on the plate. Right. Uh, there's just something about that hot tamale. It's our food, even though it originated in the Delta. And I, you know, the only thing we can figure out is when those farm workers came in up there, uh, that's why it's in the Delta. But from the Delta, if you, if, you put, if you put a map up and put a pin everywhere there's a hot tamale maker in the state of Mississippi, you're going to see Washington County, northern Washington County, and southern Bolivar County is the epicenter of hot tamales in this country. But it's no wonder that Washington County, in Greenville particularly, is called the hot tamale capital of the world. And yes, sir? One more comment. If you go on the internet. Hang on, let me bring the mic so everybody watching can I see it too. I monopolize this conversation, <laughs> but I'm a hot tamale fan. I can uh, tell. <laughs> We like that. On the, uh, on the internet, there's something called the Tamale Trail. Yes. It goes yes. from Memphis all the way down to Natchez. And it lists all the hot tamale spots along the way. Maybe not all of them, but a lot of them. Yeah. And another unique thing about the Delta tamales, I found out they always serve crackers, saltines, with their hot tamales. I don't know why. I guess they go together. Yeah. The same, I guess the same reason people serve... Um, Saltines with their with their raw oysters. I was looking for a date. I'm not gonna find it real quick. The um, the hot tamale trail was 
underwritten by the Delta Food, the Southern Foodways Alliance. Amy Cameron Evans put together the Hot Tamale Trail several years ago. It's a wonderful resource if you decide, and I've known people who have, let, let's go, let's hit the trail. The, the, it has not been updated in years, and it needs to be, but there again, there's funding and personnel to do that. There are places on the trail that no longer exist. There are so many that are not on the trail. So if you ever decide to hit the trail and you go into a community, be sure and ask whomever you're visiting with, where else can I get tamales? So you don't want to miss anything out by doing that. And I don't know why we do the cracker. I've gotten to where I leave it off. Quick question. Uh, and just shout it out if this is okay, Chris. Those of you that eat tamales, what do you put on your tamales? Nothing. Who said lemon? Okay, you're one of a handful. I haven't done that. i got to try that. Okay, now that's a new one. Crackers with grape jelly. Do what? Wow. Okay. All right. Chili is a popular one. I do that too. Anything else? Ketchup. I do that. What, what about you? Say that again. Take a little bit of oil and pan fry them. Oh, okay. Hey, big boy, we got to try that one. Hot sauce is popular. I got to ask a question about the grape jelly. Do you just take it out of the jar and and smear the grape jelly on there? Do you let it get? I mean, how do you put the jelly, the grape jelly, on the tamale? Since that came from my wife. Father, I'm going to let her explain that. Okay. I'm really curious about that. <laughs> I don't know that there's that much to explain, except that when I was very small living in Jackson, he would go out and get them, across, he said, across the rivers, what he always said, and bring them back. And we had um, cheese, crackers, and grape jelly with them. Yeah. Would he just put the jelly on top of them? No. It was so kind of a side thing with it. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's a place in Greenwood is the first place I heard of that served potato salad. I have friends who serve coleslaw. I've heard of, I'd heard of the lemon juice, but I've never tried it. I do need to try that because I love anything with lemon. Uh, the ketchup, the chili, the cheese, um, sour cream are just, as I like to say, naked. Sometimes you, if that tamale is that good, I don't want anything masking or anything competing. I just want that naked tamale so you can taste all those flavors in there. Uh, but the pan fry, and some people do serve the fried hot tamales, deep fried, but the pan fried I'll have to try. Anybody else have any? Yeah. Me being from Greenville, knowing her family for years since she was a little bitty tyke and all that good stuff, my dad used to be in the towboat business. And... Greenville at that time was the towboat capital of the world as well. This is back in the 60s and 70s, and there at one time was 72 companies operating out of Greenville, Mississippi. Um, my dad used to run the river. He was uh, one of the port engineers for the company that he worked for, and he'd go into St. Louis and down to New Orleans to the shipyards and Wood River, Illinois, and so forth. And he always stayed at, he had certain motels and stuff that he stayed at when he was on the road. And most of those, road, those uh, motels back in those days had a restaurant or a grill or bar attached to them. <clears throat> um, I can remember the Doe's tamales, and like she was talking about back in these, the 60s and 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, Doe's used to pack their, their tamales in the gallon tin cans. And they would have newspaper on the top and secured with a rubber band, just like she presented. I can remember my dad going up to Wood River, Illinois for a long overhaul job on the boats. Well, he would leave Greenville and uh, he would go buy does before he left and he would buy several dozen of the hot tamales. And he would take them up to Wood River. And that night when he got off work, he would go into the lounge or the bar or the restaurant or wherever that he by this time, he knew everybody in there from the owner all the way down. And he would tell them to take those hot tamales back there and warm them up. Well, 
a lot of Southerners do not eat Northern food. Northern people do not, let me back up. Some Northern people do not cook the food up there the way we are accustomed to the food being cooked down here. But I've never found a Northerner that didn't like Southern food. And this was, the, this was a good example. When my dad walked in and he brought in all those dozens of hot tomatoes, the place would just go wild. <laughs> and they would take them back there and warm them up, and they would spread them out, and they would feast off of Greenville Doe's hot tomatoes. Love it. Love it. I, we are just past the top of the hour. But uh, we got copies of the book over here for sale. It is all kinds of fun. Uh, I have enjoyed flipping through it over the last week or so. Thank you all for being here today. I hope that you'll come back next week for uh, Dottie Reed Chapman and Calvin Hawkins as we're talking about how to do important and overlooked local history projects. And then don't forget about our film on the 12th. But for today, help me thank Ann Martin for this fabulous program.